Was there anyone who tried to warn us about something that happened but we didn't listen? Who? Tried to tell mom she was sick five years ago miss you mom. Same. Had her convinced to go to the hospital on Wednesday, sister talked her out of it. Thursday she went but had to leave due to sitting so long in the waiting room. She suffered from chronic pain. Friday, her home nurse ignored the fact that she couldn't get a blood pressure to register, that she was confused, and her skin was turning yellow. Saturday I got home, I had left Wednesday night for business, and she was in the hospital. I sat with her until I had to go home to leave Sunday morning. She died that Sunday from sepsis due to an untreated uti that moved to her kidney and then her blood. So sad. I'm so sorry. You should get that looked at, me to my mom it was skin cancer. 1.5 years was all it took. I was 18 at the time and halfway through my senior year of school. I'm 100% convinced that single fucking mole was the first domino in ruining my life. It'll be 11 years since I lost her on Jan 29th. Not a day goes by I don't think about it. I was in the hospital to get her for hospice. Literally down the hall less than 50 yards from her. I was in her room maybe 5 minutes before. Harry Marco Polos notified the SEC three times that whatever Bernie Madoff was doing wasn't legit and should be investigated, and all three times he was ignored. He talks about it in his book No One Would Listen. Check it out if you want to see a real facepalm example of government incompetence. Harry Marco Polos noted Bernie Madoff's return on investments were mathematically impossible. Nobody generates the exact same return, 14.1%, year after year in the stock market. They were building a big baseball stadium in Wisconsin and it was a considerably windy day. The crane operator was tasked with lifting a large structure but refused stating dangerous gusts. The site foreman dismissed the crane operator and called in one who would do the job with no pushback. While the crane tipped over with a load and workers were killed. Foreman and second operator were arrested, and if I recall correctly the first operator won a wrongful termination lawsuit. You're referring to the big blue disaster. Rick Rescorla, director of corporate security for Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, published a report in 1990 detailing the vulnerability of the World Trade Center parking garage. He and a colleague found they were able to freely walk into the garage, which contained many structural support columns, unchallenged by any security. Additionally no ID checks or screening was done on any of the entering delivery vehicles. Three years later a truck bomb was driven into the garage and detonated in an attempt to damage the building's structure. Later he and his same college would correctly predict the next attack on the building would come from the air. The evacuation plan and drills he put in place are credited with saving over 2,600 lives on September 11th. Edited for a bit of clarity, some are saying but if he evacuated people, doesn't that mean we listened? Rick worked for one company in the building, not the Port Authority who managed the building's overall safety plan. After the first plane crashed, the announcements from the Port Authority told everyone to shelter in place, and not evacuate. He had developed his own evacuation plan for his employees and put it place before any official word to evacuate the building was given. May he rest in peace. He died during the attacks of September 11, 2001, going back to help evacuate more people in the South Tower after he had organized the evacuation of the Morgan Stanley offices. https colon slash slash n dot m dot wikipedia dot org slash wiki slash rick underscore rescorla. What a fucking hero. I think I've heard of his story but didn't remember the name, so thank you for posting. Rick rescorla may he r.i.p. Rick died helping get people out on September 11th, one of the last people to see him said you need to get out too. He said something like I will. But he didn't make it. I worked for Morgan Stanley then, but in Houston. I had colleagues in the towers that day including my best friend. Watching the towers fall on TV we thought there's no way everyone made it out, but all my local people made it out. Of 3,800 MS employees at World Trade, just 13 perished, thanks to crazy luck and Rick. He's a goddamn hero. I'll never forget him. He ran his own safety drills until people knew them by heart. The impression I got reading about him afterwards was that people thought him well-meaning but a bit loony. Hell of a way to be proven right. I think to be truly good at security, you have to be a little paranoid. You also have to think of the worst-case scenarios. Which can be pretty dark. That usually shows a little. Yep, a good friend of mine was the head of security of a major sports venue. His outlook on life was interesting to say the least. To illustrate how dark, I've thought about the fact that sometimes there is no great or even good answer. 
doing things perfectly right might raise survival from 10% to 20%. They can honestly look their co-workers in the eye and say I can double your chance of making it out of here if you follow my directions. What they may not say is, and if you all do it, only 800 die instead of 900. Their job, the entirety of every resource spent on them, was to move that needle from 900 down to 800. I talked to some people who made it out. The first thing that stood out to me was that they didn't listen to authorities who told them. Ro stay put. Ada, I agree with your comment 100% I should have said that initially. Wow what a story. Sounds like he lived and died a hero. Roger Boisterly, engineer involved with the space shuttle program who warned his superiors for months prior to the Challenger disaster that launching in cold weather could cause the O-rings to fail. Care to guess what caused the Challenger disaster? And for his trouble, he was a pariah to future employers. Punished for his integrity. My freshman year of college all the engineering students has to take a class about the role of engineers in society. We had a unit about catastrophic failures, Challenger, Bhopal, Deepwater Horizon, Turkish Airlines 981, etc., and every single story went the exact same way engineers slash techs noticed something was wrong, tried to warn everyone, the higher-ups ignore them because money, disaster strikes. It was honestly really disheartening. We're taught to act with integrity and speak up when something is wrong, but get ignored and punished for it. This happens in other fields as well. And the higher-ups who refuse to listen are oddly never the ones who get blamed. Sad how realistic every disaster movie where they don't listen to the expert is. I've heard that he refused to sign the launch orders for the doomed mission, even told his wife the night before they're going to blow up the shuttle tomorrow. The weather that morning was unreal, it had been well below freezing overnight, there were literally icicles on the shuttle. Even a 24-hour postponement would have been enough. I saw him talking about it in this day in history. The PR people in charge of NASA were adamant the launch go ahead because Reagan had a speech to give that night. Imagine not listening to an expert's recommendations because of a fucking president's speech. Jesus Christ, people are so fucking stupid. It's a big thing that is studied in psychology and also engineering courses. Group think and losing sight of the real goal, sunk cost and not wanting to disappoint a superior. So many lessons learned. I still cry thinking about that disaster. Reagan gave a speech. Just not the one he intended. You might be confusing Boisterly with Bob Ebeling, who told his wife it's going to blow up. At age 89, he told NPR, I think that was one of the mistakes that God made. He shouldn't have picked me for the job. But next time I talk to him, I'm gonna ask him, why me? You picked a loser. Give the audio a listen at 221, it's heartbreaking. There were at least five different engineers that were trying to stop the launch. Those were two of them. I knew a guy who was a junior QA engineer at Raytheon when that happened. He came to work at my company almost a year later. He was a mess. Very intelligent but couldn't let it go. It wouldn't surprise me if he was dead or in an institution by now. Fucked him up good. It must be miserable to try to tell people about a problem and nobody listens, only for it to result in a major disaster later. Talk about an internalized sense of failure and constant grappling with the question of if you could have done more. He kept saying that he should have done more. He never did get over that. He was on, I want to say NPR, and was receiving call-ins. One of them was a Challenger family member calling to say it's not his fault. I remember him trying not to cry hearing that. That made me nearly cry reading it so he's a more stoic man than I. Shit, I'd have cried hearing that. I'm damn near crying hearing him hearing about it. Who could? Once lives are lost that weighs heavily on the psyche and breaks a person. Is this the one Big Bird was meant to go on originally? Yep, it's the one that a teacher ended up going on. Watched by children all across America who were excited to see a normal person go to space. Instead they saw a brutal death live on TV. Am I right in recalling that they originally thought the occupants were dead after the initial explosion but upon reviewing data it looked like they were trying to save it until impact? Yep that's the one. I'm not sure which I'd fear more, being in the Challenger or in the submarine that the Russians refused any help on rescuing at the bottom of the ocean. Yes to both. I'd fear both. The Kursk is the worst, by a mile. Challenger, you're panicking and trying to do things to save yourself, 
or for most of the passengers watching someone try to save them, and stuff is happening all the time, it's 100% scary but you're still alive and you're dead. Meanwhile, on the Kursk they will have died from a lack of oxygen. Which is usually fine, because you just fall asleep. The problem is that they were filling their space with carbon dioxide. Now, unlike carbon monoxide, CO2 is not, edit, very poisonous. However, it displaces oxygen just like water does, and it creates extreme anxiety when you breathe in too much of it. Those sailors died from their own exhalations, and were almost certainly in a state of absolute fear before they passed out. Edit, technically, CO2 is poisonous, but it will kill you by asphyxiation way before it poisons you. It actually is worse than that if I recall it right, the people in the last compartment survived the explosions, only to die when their CO2 scrubbers, potassium superoxide, contacted water and or oil while they were trying to replace slash use them, causing a flash fire, likely killing some and suffocating the rest. I had to write a paper on the Kursk for university and the rough part is that it was bungled from the start. They didn't notice it was missing for almost six hours. If they had called other countries for help right when the first explosion happened, which a few other ships reported, but got ignored, then the crew stuck in the back ninth compartment could have theoretically been rescued. However, it's not certain they would have been alive, given the accident with the potassium canister. The submarine one was slashes worse because it went on for a while. And not everyone died at the same time, that is, people continued to die around them, in the cold and dark. You can see the growing despair by the writings of the team captain. In total everyone, 118 men, died on the Kursk. Below are the 23, who initially survived, but then died as help was not in time. Edit, Clarity. This is heartbreaking. 100% rather die in an explosion or crash than be left deep under the sea in the dark. There have been shipwrecks where crew have been found years later having marked off weeks on the calendar after the sinking. Pearl Harbor being obvious example. Those guys they could hear banging on the walls but had no way to save. Fucking brutal. Thanks for the new nightmare fuel, never getting on a ship. Wow. I definitely remember a few years ago when a ship sank off the coast of if I recall correctly Nigeria, and divers, who went there to retrieve bodies, entered a room and found a man alive. It was several days after the boat sank, and they put a mask with scuba equipment on him and brought him back out, dehydrated and hypothermic, but uninjured. There was a case a few years back of a ship's chef who was the sole survivor of a sinking. The ship was on the seabed about 110 feet down, and divers went in thinking this was purely a body recovery mission. Video of the dive is available on it and you can actually hear a noise from the diver as this man's hand reaches out to grab him. Turns out he'd been there almost three days and in that time he'd been alone, in the pitch black, and he heard sharks eating the bodies of the other crew. The air pocket he was in was just big enough that he survived until help came. Interestingly his sense of time was very altered by the experience as he initially thought he'd been down there for only a short period of a few hours. Absolutely. At least free fall is exhilarating, dying at the bottom of the ocean just sounds like complete dread. I'm friends with his son. What happened to that man is unjust. I mentioned it in another comment here, but I saw his dad speak when I was in college. It was one of the best lectures I've been privy to. I think of it quite often even now 20 years later. Please let your friend know that his father changed at least one person's tolerance for risk and strengthened a voice of caution. Turkish Airlines Flight 981 would never have happened if McDonnell Douglas and Convair had heeded Dan Applegate's warning about the cargo doors coming open during flight. He wrote a memo after the non-fatal American Airlines Flight 96 advising that the doors had design flaws which would cause them to show as properly latched even when they weren't. If nothing were done, he said it would lead to catastrophic failure that would likely result in the loss of the plane. However, the fixes would be expensive and no one agreed who would eat the cost, so proper upgrades were put off. Instead, they tried implementing cheaper band-aid solutions that would ultimately prove ineffective. I remember watching that instead of fixing the issue they put a small window for the baggage handler to check if the door was latched properly upon closing. Unreal how they shifted enormous responsibility to the lowest paid worker. Thankfully, the courts told them to pound sand after the crash when they tried to blame the baggage team. I'm sorry, what? After all their bullshittery, they tried to blame the baggage team? From memory the baggage handler that was assigned to close the door did not speak English. The instructions next to the door controls on how to close the hatch correctly were only printed in English. 
and they wanted to pin the crash on him. Written in two languages, including English, but he didn't speak either. Also, there was supposed to be redundancy, but that all failed too. You slash Admiral underscore Cloudberg has an excellent write up on this, and hundreds of other, air disasters. Really well done and easy to follow. Read it. Ignaz Semmelweis often described as the father of hand washing. In the 1800s, he discovered that infant maternal mortality could be drastically reduced by doctors washing their hands between patients. He was largely ignored, and his book got absolutely slated. This is supposed to have contributed to him having a mental breakdown and he died in a psychiatric hospital. Not just between patients, between working on cadavers and delivering babies. How are kids in today's world supposed to grow strong immune systems if they're not immersed in rotting putrid flesh the moment they're pulled out of the womb? We're breeding the human race to be weak. Life was much better when we'd have 14 kids and only 5 would live to adulthood. Absolutely mind-boggling. It makes me think about what kinds of things that we do now that in 200 years people will be like what the fuck were they thinking? Using plastic and then carelessly throwing it away. Making clothes with plastic. Right. They wore plastic or maybe single-use plastic has very good odds of being our generation's hand washing. 12 TRW engineers resigned their positions the morning of the Challenger incident in protest against risking the flight. NASA launched anyway should have listened. I genuinely did not know this, but it puts the tragedy in an entirely different light for me. I highly recommend listening to the You're Wrong About podcast episode about the Challenger. Maybe it was because I was in Florida when it happened, but it was a huge deal in our school system. I watched Liv as a fourth grader. Basically, it was quite preventable and they went the duct tape and cardboard route instead of quality and safety. Line a few coffins, line a few pockets. French General Ferdinand Foch reportedly called the Treaty of Versailles a 20-year armistice, e not conducive to lasting peace. World War II broke out approximately 20 years later. Otto von Bismarck in the 1880s I believe said that when the Great European War came it would come out of some damn foolish thing in the Balkans. Bismarck, who departed 20 to 24 years before World War I broke out, depending on your view of what counts as departing government. H.G. Wells said he wanted his epitaph to be I told you so. You damned fools. In The Land Ironclads, 1903, he had written about a stalemated war fought by trench warfare that was broken by the invention of tanks, predicting what would happen in World War I. In The War in the Air, 1907, he predicted how airplanes would be used in war, including aerial bombardment of cities, and saw his predictions come true in World War II. Nervously side eyes a copy of War of the Worlds. Don't worry the chances of anything coming from Mars are a million to one, they say. Edit, thanks for the upvotes, PPL, but all these commenters should get some 1970s rock music lessons. https colon slash slash u2.b slash 53d8vt, OKA. Edit Colleen, Rowley warned her FBI superiors in June 1st that names on their jihadi watch list were taking flying lessons but not interested in learning how to land her report didn't get read until October. I think you mean Colleen Rowley. Cynthia Rowley appears to be some sort of fashion designer? I was about to say. Just bought a Cynthia Rowley beach towel and thought well that's certainly a career change. Fuck you all, nobody listens to me anyway, I'm gonna go make towels. Mood. Lol I love Cynthia Rowley and I can just picture her in her fashion gowns desperately calling the FBI to no avail lol. Bismarck warned the ruling German monarch of his time that Germany's status in Europe and the relative peace of the continent would last for only a short time. After his forced resignation, Bismarck said, Jenna came 20 years after the death of Frederick the Great, the crash will come 20 years after my departure if things go on like this. 20 years later, Germany loses World War I and almost collapses. It will be some damn fool thing in the Balkans that sets it off. We Balkans are a tenacious bunch. Harry Markopoulos. He figured out what Madoff was up to, and the SEC still blew him off for years, presumably because the proof he was presenting required math to understand. Harry's motivations really spoke to me. His boss said hey I need you to invent a financial product exactly like this one that this Madoff character is selling, he is taking a lot of our customers. 
Harry went on to use math to prove it was either one of two things. Front running, where if you are a market maker and you have a list of orders from your clients you can sneak your orders in just before since you know it will change the price right after. This does not scale to the levels Madoff was claiming as profits to his clients but at the time it was considered an option they did not know how much he was claiming he was profiting across all his investors. The second possibility was just a straight-up Ponzi scheme. He told his boss it was not mathematically possible to do what Madoff was doing and the boss blew him off because he thought Harry just didn't want to work hard enough to make a similar product to what Madoff was doing. The guy uncovered the largest fraud in history to stop his boss from asking him to do an impossible task. It's not mathematically possible. But just do it though. I'm sure a lot of people can relate. I need you to draw seven perpendicular lines. You're the expert aren't you? https colon slash slash www.youtube.com slash watch v equals brookwarp 55 acfg spite and laziness are the only two forces that could ever win out over greed madoff was also rich at the time and very much in with the highly wealthy crowd i'm sure that had nothing to do with why he was largely ignored by regulators slash f if you like the video Hit that subscribe button for more content. I post every day and I'll see you next time with more stories.